Okay, today we're going to begin a topic called hypothesis testing. Now that sounds very, very vague and very far-reaching, and it actually is. The idea of a hypothesis testing is most of the time, I want you to think about it this way, you're going to test a claim, okay? So Graham claims to be an 80% free throw shooter. We can test it using free throws, can't we? Right? Lindsay says the tires she sells last 40,000 miles each. We can test that, can't we? Right? Um, Miski claims that she can jump 12 feet in the air without any you know, extra help, and we can, we can test that claim. Anything that you look at where there's a measurement involved, you can test the claim. But it could be something as this. Um, Ricardo said, well, I did an opinion poll recently, and 75% of the people on campus feel this way about a certain thing. Can we test that claim? Sure, because we can go out and do our own thing. So the idea with testing a claim is we do the statistics necessary, and hypothesis testing, we are always testing one of the following. We are testing something about mu, p, or sigma. In other words, a population parameter. We're testing that the population is this, this, or this. Now, this is not the same as a confidence interval. In a confidence interval, we go out, we collect data, and then we, can, we create a confidence interval around mu or p or sigma. That's awesome. But it's really, there's a commercial on TV, and you're saying, I don't believe that's true, so you're gonna try to disprove, think of it that way. So you go out and you collect your data and say, can I disprove what they're saying on TV, or does my data support what they're saying on TV? That's the idea of a hypothesis testing. There's already something that we're kind of accepting as fact, you see. So if somebody makes a claim on television, let, let's just say a product makes a claim and you don't believe it, is the burden on them to prove it or is the burden on you to prove it's not what they're saying? So is the burden on, on them to prove what they're saying or is the burden on you to prove that they're not telling the truth in a sense? What do you think? I'll give you another way. You've just you've been accused of a crime. You're going to trial. Is the burden of proof on you to prove your innocence? Or is the burden of proof on the other side to prove your guilt? I'll give you a hint. It's an absolute contradiction of all forms of logic and possibility. There is no human being that could prove their own innocence on anything. There's absolutely nothing that you can prove your innocence on, believe it or not. That would be an absolute impossibility. Because you can't prove absolutely. That's why guilt has to be proved, absolutely. And if you're not guilty, you can't be proven guilty. That's impossible. That, that again, would be a contradiction of logic. So if I accuse Lindsay of the crime, can you prove your own innocence? Can you prove you weren't there? Can you prove you didn't do it? <laughs> well, I have video evidence. How do I know it's accurate? How do I know you didn't doctor? How do I know that, you know, <laughs> you get right down to it, there's no way you could ever prove your own innocence, so you don't have to. It's up to the other side to prove your guilt. So when somebody makes a claim on television, they're already on television. They're already, they've already done it. They don't have to prove the claim. Strangely enough, you have to prove that it's not the case. But what if you do prove it's not the case? Ooh, then they can't say it anymore. Do you know what the most tested thing, product, substance on planet Earth is by a lot? Cigarettes. Why would, would cigarettes be, be tested so often? I mean, all the time, cigarettes being tested. Because cigarettes, on the box itself, a carton of cigarettes will tell you exactly how much tar and nicotine and all the different you know, chemicals, they'll tell you. And it's all these dangerous things and they have their warnings. But people are always trying to find them you know, telling a lie because if I can prove that it's worse than they say, then they can get in all sorts of trouble. So the cigarette companies are smart enough to know that no, we, we better get the information correct. We better be accurate. But there have been so many lawsuits over the years about, about cigarettes. So many times that you know, people have gone, it's gone to trial where you know, somebody developed lung cancer because they smoked and the family wanted to you know, sue the cigarette company because it's their fault. And they said, this person knowingly smoked, knowing the risks. Sorry, but it'd be like you play out in the middle of the freeway and you get hit by a car. That's on you, that's not on somebody else. <laughs> you shouldn't have been playing in the middle of the freeway. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna smoke cigarettes, you know the risk. There, there's not too many Americans who don't know the risk of smoking a cigarette, right? So you can't sue the cigarette company, okay? That's like the drunk driver suing the alcohol company. They, they knew the risks when they you know, started drinking. So 
the idea of a hypothesis test is we have a situation and we can test it. So it's how do I actually state what I'm testing? So there's two things going on here. There's something called, we call it H0, and that's what we say is the null hypothesis, hypo, hypothesis. And then there's H1, which is called the alternative. Literally, these are complements. It's one or the other. Alternative hypothesis. Now, the null hypothesis is always what we accept is true unless the evidence shows otherwise. And I will emphasize this every single day, every single problem. We accept the null as being the truth. By the way, it doesn't mean we believe it's the truth. It's our starting point. So when Graham says, I'm an 80% free throw shooter, you know what we start by accepting? We accept that he's an 80% free throw shooter, and then we let the evidence tell us otherwise. Does that make sense? Ah, so when, so when there's some claim made about something, we say, okay, the null hypothesis we will accept is the truth. The alternative is the evidence showed, no, it, it can't be the truth. The evidence was too overwhelming in the other direction. So we will say we will reject this and we'll say this is the truth. So we always start with the null. Now, everything is a measurement, because remember I said we're testing one of these three things, so there will always be an inequality involved, okay? Now I wanna make sure everybody understands how, how this part works. Let's say, for example, there's a certain weight loss product, and they say, you know, if you use our product for a month, you'll lose 10 pounds. Okay, let's just say that's the thing. And you're going, I don't know. So you get a whole bunch of people together to be, your, to be your sample, and they all do the weight loss product, and on average, they lost 12 pounds. The company said you'll lose 10 pounds. They lost 12. So are they lying? What do you think? Would you say 12 pounds is better than their claim? I got a whole bunch of people together and they only lost on average three pounds. The company claimed they were gonna lose 10. And I have a really large sample and they were only losing three pounds. Now would you say the company might be lying? Yeah, you say that, it's not nearly enough. You see, we state things as equalities, but usually most things are inequalities. I'm gonna demonstrate that in a moment. So if the company says you're gonna lose 10 pounds and you end up losing more than 10 pounds, are you going to say, they're lying, they're better than they claim? No. <laughs> no one's going to be upset if it's better than they claim. So Graham claims to be an 80% free throw shooter. He goes out and he shoots 90%. Aha, you're a liar. You're better than... No, we would only say, no, if it was way less than 80, would we call you? Do you agree? So if he says he's an 80% free throw shooter, what he's really saying is I shoot at least 80%. If that weight loss place says you're going to lose 10 pounds, you're going to lose at least 10 pounds. It's okay if you lose more, do you agree? It's if you lose less that there, there's a problem. Oh, so I'm gonna prepare you for your next exam. You know, maybe it's an SAT prep. And, and, and I'm gonna guarantee you're only gonna miss five questions. And Maria didn't miss any, so I'm lying. No, would you be upset if you didn't miss any? No, what would you be upset if I said, I will guarantee you will only miss five questions? If you miss 10, you're upset. Do you agree? That's not good. I, I didn't fulfill my end of the bargain, but if you get a perfect score, you're not going to say, Mr. Brown, you lied to me. Well, no, if it's better than I claim, you're not upset. You're only upset if it's worse than I claim. So inequalities always exist. Now I'm going to make this really simple. Today you're going to go to the grocery store, you got 20 bucks cash in your hand. So when you get to the check stand and, and they ring everything up and it's $19.25, you go, darn, I can't leave. Ah, i got to go back and find 75 cents worth of stuff, right? Or is it okay if you have $20 in your pocket to actually spend less than $20? Is that okay? I have a half a tank of gas left and i got to drive a ways. So I get to my destination and I still have a little gas left. Darn, I gotta go out and drive until I run out of gas. Or is it okay to stop before I run out of gas? <laughs> Anybody taken the written test for the driving test in the last year or two? I, I believe, every, I hear a different story every time, but I think you can miss six questions. That's what I hear people tell me. So Ricardo takes the test and he only misses one question. Darn, I gotta go back and, and, and make some wrong answers here because I gotta miss six. Or is it okay to miss less than six? 
Six was the upper limit, wasn't it? When we speak, we speak inequalities. You can miss six questions. You got $20 you need to spend at the store. You got a half a tank of gas. Those are exact values. But when the situation comes, none of those are equal. I don't have to spend exactly $20. It's okay to spend less. I don't have to use up my whole gas tank. I can use up less. <laughs> right? it's, it's okay. Does everybody understand? These are all inequalities, but we state this. Okay. Now, um, most of you don't, well, some of you do remember this. Okay. You're in junior high school. You're, you're probably with some group, might be some you know, youth group or something, and you went to a, an amusement park. Could be Legoland, could be Disneyland, could be somewhere. Now, the guys understand this, and the girls don't, because you were full grown at 13. But there was the evil clown. You guys remember the cardboard cutout clown? Anybody remember the clown? That said, you must be this tall to ride the ride. You guys know what I'm talking about? Oh yes, the evil cardboard clown. And the girls don't understand this because you were already this tall at 13, but most of the guys weren't. <laughs> and so you couldn't ride the ride because you weren't that tall. Now, what if you come along and you were way taller than the clown? Does that mean you can't ride? Only people that were exactly the same height as the clown could ride the ride? When you said you must be this tall, what were they actually saying? At least this you must be at least this tall. You guys remember the evil clown? I, I, what? <laughs> My son, I remember Legoland, because I was a parent helper, and, and he would do, they would do the Legoland trip in school every year, and there's some like roller coaster-ish ride. You guys know what, know what I'm talking about? There, there's some, it's like a little mini roller coaster, but he wasn't tall enough to ride the ride, more than one year in a row. So I remember the, the year he finally broke, broke free, he got a bunch of newspaper, wadded it up, <laughs> put it in his shoes. <laughs> Spiked and gelled his hair. <laughs> and he, he, he just made it. He, he, he had to cheat a little bit, but he, but he made it. He was finally tall enough to ride the ride. But the point is, that clown that says you must be this tall, you don't have to be exactly that tall. You had to be at least that tall. You couldn't be shorter than the clown and still ride the ride. So even though we say you must be this tall, there's an inequality implied there. Okay, so you're only going to accept the job if they offer you a certain amount of money. They offer you more than that, then you're not going to accept the job, right? right? <laughs> Wait a minute. Des says, I'll only accept the job if they offer me 50000 a year, and they offered you 75000 a year. No way you're taking that job. You said 50000 Wait a minute. If they offer you seventy five, that's better. Wouldn't that be okay? What will cause you not to take the job? And they offered you less. And again, most everything in life, most everything is an inequality, even though we don't always state it. Most everything that we state as inequality is really an at least or an at most. And you have to be aware of that and you have to interpret it that way. Um, again, this is the whole point of hypothesis testing is understanding how we actually set the problem up. So Lindsay, she has a tire company. They sell tires. They say, you're going to get 40,000 miles. What are they actually saying? You're going to get at least 40, you're going to get at least forty thousand miles because if you get less than forty thousand, you're going to say I'm taking them back. Everybody got that? So in other words, more is okay, but less is not okay. So we have to understand that's how it works. So when I'm stating my null hypothesis, my null hypothesis has to include the equals. There's always an inequality. The null has to include the equals because I said the equals is what we're accepting as the truth. Now. There's a different one that goes out. I have a scale at home, and I'm not sure if it's accurate. That means it might measure too heavy, it might measure too light. So I'm stepping on the scale, and let's just say I'm 180 pounds. I am 180 pounds. And the scale says 180 pounds. And I don't know if the scale's accurate. I have no reason to believe it's heavy or light. I just want to know, is it accurate? Has anybody ever weighed themselves on the scale at the gym? Is that trustworthy or might it be the most untrustworthy scale on planet Earth? Every gym scale, you know, the kind where you slide the thing back and forth to balance it. Do you know why those are the worst scales on planet Earth? Because the previous knucklehead always left the weight all slid all the way over, right? The, the guy that was 240 pounds left it on 240 pounds. Why is that bad? Because the moment one person leaves it, it already is starting to make an effect. 
So if you leave it on there, it'll never be accurate again. You leave it on for long periods of time, now everybody's off by a few pounds. But you don't know in which direction it's off. So I want to know, is my scale accurate or not? Do I weigh 180 pounds or do I not weigh 180 pounds? Oh, so that's an equals versus a not equals. I'm buying the 50 pound bags of cement at Home Depot. I'd like to know, do they actually weigh 50 pounds? Not are they heavier or are they lighter, do they actually weigh 50 pounds? We've used this example with the five pound bag of potatoes over sprouts. We know it's probably not gonna weigh five pounds, but it might be too heavy, it might be too light. I don't know which way it goes, I just wanna know is it accurate, okay? So there's three types of inequalities that the null can be. The null, whoops, is it gonna be good? The null can be greater than or equal, it can be less than or equal, it can be equal. That's what the null would be. Whatever I'm measuring, and I'll go through each one. It can be one of those three, because all three of those include the equals. And again, the first rule of hypothesis testing is whatever the equal is, we start by accepting that as the truth. Whether it's the truth or not is irrelevant. We start with that being the truth, and then we say, does the evidence show otherwise? That is always the way I'm going to explain this. So if that's the null, then what would the alternative be for each one of these? Well, what's the, what's the alternative to greater than or equal? What's, what's left? Less than. What's the alternative to less than or equal? Greater than. Greater than. And what's the alternative to exactly equal? Good. You guys got it? So these are the only this and this, this and this, this and this. That's it. That's not complicated. Because what we want to do is cover all possibilities. Now, in the textbook, the author often only goes in one direction. He does it equal versus greater than, equals versus less than, which is a problem. Okay, so again, Graham claims that he's an 80% free throw shooter. So my null hypothesis is that he shoots 80%. I don't believe he's that good, so the alternative would be you're less than that. But the problem is, what if he goes out and shoots better than 80%? We don't have that accounted for. That's why it's, if he says 80%, we're going to say at least 80%. That way, the only way we'd say, no, you're not telling the truth, is if the evidence showed the other way extremely. Does everybody follow that? So we always want, we always want these two things when put together to be every possible outcome. But the one that includes the equals is always the null because that's what we're starting with as being the truth, whether you believe it or not. So this is why, let's say um, there's a certain pharmaceutical and usually, it's not unusual, 10 years of testing and the FDA finally approves it, okay? It's been tested and tested and tested for its efficacy, its safety, all these things. Okay, we finally approved it. Now, some bad things happen maybe down the road, and, and, and a lot of people, you know, maybe don't do so well with this thing. And so, Ashad says, you know what, I, I think this thing is dangerous. I think they may, may have messed up. So you go out and you conduct a sample, and you get a bunch of people, and you, you, you do your thing. It's not, the burden of proof is not on the pharmaceutical to prove it's safe. It's already on the market. The burden of proof is on you to prove that it is unsafe. There's a claim made on television and advertising, and you guys can pick advertisements all over the place. You can pick them apart. And the claim is to be this good, and you're saying, there's no way. I've had experience. There's no way it's that good. It's the burden of proof is not on them to prove they're that good. The burden of proof is on you to prove they're not that good. Like I said, when you go to trial, the burden of proof is not on you to prove your own innocence. The burden of proof is on the other person to prove you're guilty. That's how it always works. Otherwise, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Somebody accuses you of something and now you have to prove you're innocent? You can't do that. We talked about that at the beginning. That's actually not possible to prove your innocence. But it, we talk about this in mathematics all the time. To prove a true statement is true sometimes is very difficult because it means you have to consider every possible case, and that can be infinitely many cases. But to prove a false statement is false is usually fairly simple. If I say something and you don't believe it, how many times does it have to be false? Only once. How many times does it have to be true? Always, every possible case. Do you see why proving something's true is a lot harder than proving something's false? That's why 
if you are truly not guilty, then proving you're guilty should be impossible. But you shouldn't have to prove that you're not guilty. So that's the whole idea. So the proof is always, we start with, we're going to do several examples. We start with the situation, what are we accepting as the truth? And then we go out and we collect our samples. We measure our samples. We calculate the P or the mu or the sigma. We calculate the confidence interval. We do whatever and we say, hey, you know what? The evidence is overwhelming in this direction. So what we do is we say, this is not the truth, this is. In other words, we say, no, 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 we're rejecting the not guilty, you're guilty, and <laughs> this is the truth. But if the evidence isn't overwhelming, now understand this, because we're gonna talk about this a lot, what we're doing next is literally exactly the same as how a court of law works. Now I've, I've been, oh my God, I've had jury duty more times than I can count. For something to go to trial, do you know what the rule is for something to go to trial? In any situation, you've been accused of a crime. Are you going to trial automatically? No, there actually has to be enough evidence to convict you. They, uh, uh, basically an independent you know, panel would be looking at this saying, there has to be enough evidence to actually convict you. Then it can go to trial. Now, will you be convicted? Now it's the lawyers are working and they're interviewing, they're doing all their stuff. But there has to actually be enough evidence to convict you or it won't go to trial. Doesn't matter whether you're guilty or innocent. If there's not enough evidence to convict you before we start, it's a complete waste of time to even start the process. If there's not enough evidence, it would be impossible to find you guilty. So why would we even bother? So if something's going to trial, you know what you can literally say? We can start by assuming they are mostly guilty. But to be guilty, how guilty do you have to be? Beyond a reasonable doubt. Which literally might as well say 100% guilty. Oh, so if you're mostly guilty, but it might be circumstantial, wrong place, wrong time. You just, I can't prove you're guilty. There's just not enough there. Then you're not guilty. Does not guilty mean innocent? No. In fact, in your lifetime, you may never even hear of a situation where somebody is actually declared innocent. To be, that means they literally arrested the wrong person. They, they got it all completely wrong. There was nothing there. It was a mistake from the beginning. Does it happen that an innocent person is convicted. Does it ever happen? Yes, it is extremely rare. I mean, there's a lot of people in prison. There are very few that are actually innocent. And just, it was a terrible miscarriage of justice if that is the case. That is the horrible thing. That's why as a society, and this, by the way, this goes back even to the ancient Greeks. As a society, we've always said, when we give the choice, what's worse, letting an innocent person, excuse me, letting a guilty person go free or convicting an innocent person? Which do we consider worse as a society? Convicting, convicting an, it's not even close. So what we do is we make it ridiculously hard to convict somebody. So do guilty people get set free? Oh, all the time. Because there wasn't enough there to absolutely convict them. But we say we can accept that error so that we minimize the possibility of ever convicting an innocent person. So everything goes to trial. It's determined that, man, you were absolutely innocent. There's a, tip, there's a different word that is used. It's called, you are exonerated. And you, you basically, you only hear that one like if you're watching a TV show on stuff. You just, you just never hear that one. Because it, that means that everything was wrong to begin with. That, that person should never have gone to trial. There was never any evidence whatsoever. Now, wrong place, wrong time. You might have been involved a little bit. You know, there's circumstantial stuff. Hey, it's a bad look. You're going to trial. We found you not guilty. Great. Not guilty doesn't mean innocent, it just means you weren't 100% guilty. You were only mostly guilty. Now, you guys have all seen The Princess Bride? One of the greatest movies ever made. You guys remember? Right? Do you remember The, the Man in Black? He was only mostly dead? Yeah. And they bring him back because if you're only mostly dead, you're still part alive. That was the whole idea. He, he was dead, but he was not 100% dead. He was only mostly dead. I, I always thought that was funny because if you're mostly dead, you're still a little bit alive and they were able to bring him back. It's, it's a classic movie, you guys, if you haven't seen it. No spoiler alert, it came out, I think, in 1987. So, you know, classic movie. Andre the Giant's in it. And, you know, anyway, so the idea is, in that situation in the court of law, you are guilty or you are not guilty. Those are compliments, aren't they? My jug of water is full or it is not full. 
It's not full or empty. Right now it's halfway full. If you say full or empty, there's an infinite number of states in between that we're leaving out. If I say full or not full, is empty included in the not full? Yes. So if I say guilty or not guilty, is innocent included in not guilty? Yeah. But if you say not guilty, you're not saying innocent. You're just saying there wasn't enough guilt to convict. Now, is that a problem? No. I mean, you're not guilty. Okay. We move on. Uh, any vets here? There's no such thing as not guilty in the military. <laughs> Can't be. You're, you're the captain. You've Something bad happened on your watch. I know somebody that this happened. Something bad happened on your watch. I knew somebody who, they were the, on the ship, what's that called? The chief? I think the chief. There was a very famous case in San Diego. Something happened, something broke, and people were killed on the ship. The person who was in charge is held responsible. In other words, there's no, there's no not guilty. You're guilty or you're innocent. And because, unfortunately, my father-in-law is retired in the military. He was a captain in the Navy for many years. He said, that somebody always has to be blamed. They're, they Literally, there's no such thing as an accident, even though there, it's an accident. And so when you go to trial, or something happened... So the idea is in the military, they said, no, no, we, we have to have innocent. Because let's say you're the captain and you're in charge of a lot of people. How are they going to look at you if you were found not guilty? <laughs> Knowing how the trial system works means you were mostly guilty and now you're going to go back and lead a bunch of people. Th that would be pretty sketchy, wouldn't it? In other words, would you lose all of their trust and faith? Yeah. So in the military, you have to be guilty or innocent. Because they need the innocent. They need to know that you were clear. Because you are a leader, you are in charge. That's completely different from the rest of society because you can never prove innocence in the rest of society. But there they, they take it a step further. We never need to prove absolute in the other direction. We just say, if somebody says something, are they telling the truth or do we have enough evidence to say otherwise? That's what we're looking at. So, we're going to go through and talk about how do we actually do this. All right? So, we're going to do several examples. So I'll start with, with Grant. He claims he makes 80% of his free throws. That's it. You don't say, well, you know, I... I don't know if he's nice to his mama or if he eats his vegetables. No, it, we're, we're testing this. This is a numerical value. Are, is this going to be a test on mu, p, or sigma, ultimately, you think? Mu. What does the 80% refer to? Isn't that 0.8? Oh, okay. Isn't that the probability he makes a free throw? P. So it's P. Mm. Oh, we're, we're doing a test on P. And by the way, it is important we know which one we're testing because that also determines how we do the test. So, you don't believe it. You're going to say, you know, I, I, show me. Okay? I'll put, you don't believe. And you demand. You demand proof. Well, how does he prove himself? He goes, I shoot free throws. <laughs> That's it. Now, let's say Graham goes out and shoots one free throw and he makes it. Is that convincing evidence? But that'd be like saying he shoots one free throw and he misses it. Is that? No, no. Maybe you can make him go out and shoot 100 free throws. Okay. He shoots 100 free throws. He makes 82 of them. Has he proven himself? Absolutely. He goes out and makes 77 of them. Hmm. Now it's kind of tricky. Because if you're an 80% free throw shooter... Isn't 70 per, 77 out of 100 reasonable? Then, Because the, the next time you might be 85 out of 100. And, oh, remember when we talked about confidence interval? A confidence interval around an 80% free throw shooter is probably going to go somewhere between 70 and 90, isn't it? Oh, so if he made 77 out of 100, is that overwhelming evidence? Probably not. What if he makes 60 out of 100? Maybe that's, maybe that's more than overwhelming. That there's a line in the sand, and we're going to be able to calculate it easily enough. But that's what we're doing next time. Today, I just want to state what's going on. So, for this example, what is our null hypothesis? What are we accepting as the truth? Well, we're going to accept that he does make 80%. Exactly? Exactly 80%? At least. At least 80%. So we write it like this. 
P is greater than or equal to 0.8. We're going to accept this is the truth. We're going to accept that when he says he makes 80%, that he makes at least 80%, not at most. <laughs> then what would the alternative be? That's it. That's it. That's all we need to do. So this is what I talked about at the beginning of class, the implied inequality. He says he makes 80%, but in actuality, what he's really saying is he makes at least 80% because being better than you claim is always okay. It's being worse than you claim that we consider not okay. Y'all y'all with me on that one? So that's why it's, you know. Um, I, I need you to be, you know, I need somebody, I'm, I'm hiring somebody at work, but I have a lot of things on the top shelf, so I need you to be six feet tall. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have to get an extra ladder. Well, what if you're six foot five? Would that be okay? I need you to be six feet tall to perform this job. It, would six five be okay? What about five five? Probably not, because the whole point of being six feet tall was so you could reach something on the shelf. Being taller than that would be totally okay in that situation. Okay. Now, I, I've got this really, really tiny cockpit. I've got this little teeny tiny plane. And, and, and I, I need you to only be five feet tall so you can fit in the cockpit. Because otherwise, you know, sorry, I, sorry, McKinley, you guys are way too big, right? What if you're four foot six? Would that be okay? Yeah, being smaller than five feet would be okay. Five feet would be the most you could be to fit into the cockpit, but being smaller than five feet would be totally okay. So that's the inequality going the other way that time, okay? Let's look at another one. All right. Lindsay's tires last 40,000 miles. You were watching a commercial on TV, and you, want, you proudly drive around with the tires with the big L on them, right? Lindsay, that L. All right, so. If you get 40,500 miles, is that okay? Yes. You get 42,000, is that okay? What if you get 35,000 before they have to be replaced? No. No, you're not happy with that. You're not happy with that at all. What if you got 39,850 miles before it had to be replaced? And you take corners really fast. You, you know, like to slam on your brakes on a regular basis. In other words, you have driving habits that basically wear tires out really fast. And you got 39,850 miles, you probably did really well with these tires, didn't you? What is our null and what is our alternative? Well, first thing is, what are we doing a test on? Mu, P, or sigma? Mu. Uh, P. 40,000 probability? Hmm. Probably not P. Yeah, no, we'll go with mu. <laughs> probably mu. So what are we talking about here? Average tire life. Which variable you're representing or you're testing should be really simple. Now, what's our, would it be that mu is equal to 40,000? And would this one be, I'm asking you the question, would, would it be this? Well, then what if the tires last 50,000 miles? Well, then obviously she's lying. Wait a minute, no, but that would be great if my tires lasted 50,000 miles. So we're not going, Equal versus not equal, no, what are we going? Very similar to that one, at least, ah, at least 40,000, you will be upset if it's significantly less. Now, by the way, they lasted 39,999 miles and then I decided to replace them. Well, I probably could have got one more mile easily. The point being, one mile less isn't significantly less. So we're gonna use words like significant in a while. I have to be way less for, to say less. So when we're thinking of our curve, we're talking tails. We're always talking tail probability. Now, is the 10 pound bag of potatoes actually 10 pounds? Again, this is totally reasonable. I want everyday situations. You go down to Home Depot and you want the 50 pound bag of cement. Does it actually weigh 50 pounds? By the way, if it weighed more, you'd be okay. But the thing is, that's not what I want to know. I'm, I am the manufacturer, I'm selling them. 
I want to know how accurate is this information. If I'm saying they're 50 pounds, I don't want them to be more than 50 pounds because that means I'm giving stuff away. If, I want, if they say 50 pounds, I don't want them to be less than 50 pounds because that means you're getting cheated and you might want it replaced. Right? I, I'd like to know is that it's accurate. So in this case, what are we testing again? Are we testing mu, sigma, p? Mu. We're testing the average being 10 pounds. Good. So what is our null this time? Remember, it's either greater than or equal, less than or equal, or equal. It's got to include the equal. I'd like to know, are my measurements actually accurate? What do you think? So that'd be mu <coughs> equals 10. Versus mu, keep going. Equals slash 10. Not equal, perfect. Yeah, not equal. Does that make sense? It's not, is it too big or too little? No, is it, is it accurate or is it not accurate? When you get on that scale, when you get on that scale and you look at the weight, you don't go, oh, it's okay if it's too much. Oh, it's okay if it's too little. No, you wouldn't know, do I weigh exactly that much or do I not weigh exactly that much? Does that make sense? Yeah, this is not an at least or at most. If I'm on a scale, I just want to know, is the scale accurate or is the scale not accurate, period. So these are the, the scenarios that we're considering. Now, we're not actually doing the test yet. We're just, how do I say what I'm doing? So far, so good? All right, now, something has come up in our in our, um, our machinery, and, and we're trying to find you know, whether it's accurate, and we're, we're, we're looking at the standard deviations, and going, God, we, you know, if the standard deviation is too big, variance, if it's too much, that means I have too much inconsistency, so I want to measure it. So I need to know, you know, is the standard deviation, let's say, um, let's say we're weighing the, the bags of potatoes. If my standard deviation were really small, I, I would sell 10 pound bags of potatoes, but what I found was they generally were like 9.9, 10.1, I, they were really tight, it was really good. The person putting the potatoes in says, you know, okay, let's see, uh, let's grab this potato. I got a whole bunch of potatoes. Yeah, this potato will make it almost exactly 10 pounds. Somebody took the time and trouble to, to match the potatoes together to make it as close to 10 as possible. That seems kind of silly, but maybe you know somebody had all sorts of time on their hands. All right, so is the standard deviation, let's say 0.1 pounds, in a perfect world, what is the standard deviation? No, in a perfect world. Oh, uh, two standard deviations. No, 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 no. That's, you're giving me a range of values. I, I'm trying to measure consistency. Yeah, zero. Uh, <laughs> if, if I'm trying to measure consistency and I want everything to be exactly the same, we know that's not realistic. In other words, a perfect world standard deviation is zero. Standard deviation can never be too small. It can only be too big. Okay? It can only be too big. Um, let's say uh, I want to I want to form a basketball team but I literally want everybody on my team to look like clones it's, that's kind of funny because everybody's going to look exactly the same I mean you're down to the haircut you know you're going to look like a Korean boy band when all is said and done right you're, you're all going to look exactly the same that's my daughter's love to Korean boy bands so anyway you're, you're all going to look exactly the same you're, you're going to be everything about your look is going to be the same but you're not clones I just want you all to look like clones so I want everybody to be the exact same height, same weight, and everything. Now, is it possible that I could be absolutely, all of you the exact same height and the same weight? Eh, not very likely, but if I could, then the standard deviation of your heights would actually be zero, wouldn't it? The standard deviation of your weights would actually be zero. That would be the ultimate. But if I can keep that number really small, then that means there's very little difference between you. Okay? So I have a situation here where I'm doing the 10 pound bags of potatoes and I've got a standard deviation 0.1. Now, less than 0.1 would be totally okay. But maybe I'm saying, you know what, if it's more than that, then I have too much spread. What do you mean by too much spread? Remember, we've talked about this before. If the standard deviation is too big, that means they're all over the map. That means you're giving away product and you're shorting people noticeably. If you're giving away product, you're losing money. If you're shorting people, you have to replace the product, which means you're losing a lot more money. 
So that's why when it comes to products, we want that standard deviation as small as possible. So I may have to change the way I do things if the standard deviation is too large. So what is this a test on? Mu, P, or sigma? Sigma. Sigma, obviously. So what would the null be? Well, obviously it's got to it's got to include equal point 0.1. What what am I considering bad? Smaller than point 0.1 or bigger than point 0.1? Bigger. Bigger than because that means I'm saying there's too much spread. So what's my null then? Less than or equal, greater than or equal, or equal. Less than or equal to 0.1, so then my alternative would be greater than 0.1. We're saying that if it's bigger than 0.1, we may have to change the way we do things. That's all we're saying. Now, how will I know if it's bigger than 0.1? I go out and I collect a sample and I measure it. I test it. That's how it always works. You go out and you collect a sample and you, you do your thing. Okay? We haven't done a calculation. We're only stating what it is we're actually going to do. What are we... What are we putting on trial here? We're putting on trial, you know, the way we're doing things to see if the standard deviation is bigger or smaller. So with the 10 pound bag of potatoes, there's two different things I can test. Is it actually 10 pounds? Okay, let's say that, you know what, it's not that different from 10 pounds, we can live with it. But if the standard deviation is too big, see, here's the problem. I went out and collected 100, I went to Sprouts and I bought 100 10 pound bags. I weighed each one of them and I found the average weight was almost exactly 10 pounds. By the way, that's what you would expect. Some are more, some are less. The average overall should be right around 10 pounds. But does that mean all of the bags weighed exactly 10 pounds? Or all the bags got 9.9 .9 to 10.1? Or is it possible the bags went from about 9.5 to 10.5? You see what's happening now? Oh, if that range is really large, I can still get an average bag of 10 pounds, which made me happy. But if the range is 9.5 to 10.5, that means half the time I'm shorting people noticeably and half the time I'm giving away potatoes. That would mean, in other words, my standard deviation is too big. So having the 10 pound bags average 10 pounds is all nice and stuff, but I would really rather it be a really, really, really tight fit. Because I don't want Petra coming back and saying, hey, you shorted me and my potatoes. <laughs> or Misty leaving going, yes, I got an extra half a pound of potatoes. Well, I just gave away a half a pound of potatoes. I don't want to do that. So there's two different things we would be testing. That's why I said in general, we're more concerned with the standard deviation because getting the average to be 10 is easy. Getting the spread to be small is harder. That would mean I actually have to take the thought. So, so you know, a shot is my, my potato bag filler. And you, you've, you're, you've got a scale right there. You're at nine and a half pounds and you've got a whole bunch of potatoes. You're trying to find the combination of one or two potatoes that gets me as close to 10 as humanly possible. So you're not giving away, you're not shorting. Wow. That, that, can you imagine doing that? What a pain that would be. <laughs> you said, no, I'm going to make it easy. I'm just going to slice that last potato so now it's exactly 10 pounds, except that's the one thing we can't do. So this is how we make the statements. Now, the second thing I want to do is, how do we actually make our criteria for making our conclusion? And so we call this, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the criteria The criteria for rejecting the null hypothesis. Strangely enough, your conclusions are always going to be there was enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, or there was not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. If there's enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, I want you to think of that like a guilty verdict. Aha! We started with assuming the null is true. I start by assuming you are not guilty. That's how a court of law works. The evidence said, no, no, the null can't be true. It's got to be the other thing. The evidence was overwhelming in the other direction. So we will reject the null hypothesis. We're saying that's not the truth. The other thing is, the alternative is the truth. I'm going to reject my assumption of not guilty, and my conclusion is guilty. So rejecting the null would be the equivalent of finding you guilty. Failing to reject the null doesn't mean I, we found you innocent. It just meant there wasn't enough evidence to prove you guilty. 
So failing to reject the null hypothesis just says there wasn't enough evidence to go the other way. So Graham claims to be an 80% free throw shooter. He went out and shot 75% today. That's not 80%, but it may not have been enough evidence. It's not overwhelming. It's still too close to call. So we'd say, you know what? We don't have enough evidence to say you're not telling the truth. We'll, 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 we'll let you have that one. Now, every now and then it may, he went out and shot 85%. Well, now, duh, <laughs> you know, yeah, he's telling the truth. But usually it comes down to whatever the null hypothesis is, is there enough evidence? Evidence is the data you collected and you've now calculated. Is there enough evidence to go in the other direction? If there's not, then you say, I didn't reject the null. You don't have to say, I believe the null is true. You just say there wasn't enough evidence to reject it. I'm not saying I believe you're innocent. I'm saying there wasn't enough evidence to say you're guilty. When people are declared not guilty, nobody ever says they're innocent. I mean, the most classic case, most of you are too young to remember, 1994, the famous Bronco chase through LA, O.J. Simpson, you guys know who that is? One of the greatest football players, um, both in college football, he was considered one of the two or three best who ever played college football, one of the best running backs to ever play pro football, uh, not a great actor, but he got away with murder. I mean, quite literally. Really, really bad lawyers, and really great defense attorney. He had Johnny Cochran, who was legendary. Um, nobody on planet Earth believes OJ was innocent. Problem was, they didn't prove he was guilty. Everybody believed he was, but they didn't prove it. Therefore, he is declared not guilty. That's how it works. You have to be 100% guilty. Right? The term, when we say 100%, can you ever be absolute about anything? No, what was the term you used to show? Beyond reasonable doubt. When we're trying to do anything in here, we're doing a confidence interval or anything, aren't there always the possibilities for the extremes? Because we can't have every single outcome. I want a confidence interval around the true height of a Mesa College student. So my confidence interval, I'm pretty sure you're all going to be between zero and a billion centimeters tall. That's not useful. <laughs> I, need a, I need a reasonable confidence interval with this. There's always the possibility of the extreme. So even in a court of law, there's always the possibility that it was so extreme we missed it. But we have to take that chance because we don't want to convict somebody who is innocent. So we always err on the side of we may let the guilty person go because we make convictions so difficult that if we do convict somebody, it's, we are certain. But if we don't convict them, we just weren't certain. It wasn't beyond reasonable doubt. And, and we live with that as a society. Again, we, we say, so the other way. Now, I, I have a product, and it might be the greatest product in the world, and the FDA is testing it. And they're saying, yeah, it's great, but it's not great enough. We're not going to prove it. But it was so good, but we're not going to prove it because there was still the possibility it might not be great. They don't approve things because they're saying, you know what? There's still the potential that it's not good, and we don't want the not good free on society. So there are good things that don't get approved because I couldn't prove it was good enough. The idea being, we never want to have a bad thing get approved. Do bad things get approved? Sometimes things can slip through. Sometimes things can slip through. But in general, if something gets through, it's because it was overwhelmingly effective or good. That's the idea, that it was overwhelming in that direction. So, the criteria for rejecting the null hypothesis, this comes down to the alpha level. Remember what alpha equaled? It was the tail probability in a confidence interval. So it's a left tail, it's a right tail, or it's two tails. How do I know which one it is? Now this goes down to the null hypothesis. So I'm going to make this really, really simple. We're not going to do any chi-square today. I was asked, are we going to use that? We're only going to do z-table z stuff today. Eventually, we'll do t and we'll do chi-square. But today, I'm going to just do z because it's easier for us to conceptualize. So here's all outcomes. I can be in the left tail. I can be in the right tail. I can be in both tails. What's going to cause rejection? So I'm going to show you because there's three, three situations. All right. 
the null hypothesis is that I'll, I'll just use mu on each of these, but it, it could be it could be p because both mu and p we're going to use a z table generally. I'll just say mu was greater than or equal to a number. Here the null hypothesis was that mu was less than or equal to some number, and here the null hypothesis was the third possibility mu is simply equal to some number. So what was the alternative here? Mu was strictly less than oops, the number. What's the alternative here? Mu is greater than the number. And in the third case, what's the alternative here? Mu is simply not equal to the number. Now, Lindsay says her tires last 40,000 miles. You, you drove them and they lasted 39,983 miles. <laughs> You don't say, ah, oh, she's lying. Uh, no, they, that's almost exactly what she's claiming. No, you're, gonna, you're going to make noise if it was significantly less. What is significantly less? Tail. What would cause me to reject the null here? Look at the direction of the alternative. I will reject the null if my outcome is here, in the left tail. Not if my outcome is here. <laughs> Not if my outcome, in fact, if my outcome is at this end, then that's pretty, pretty much verification that, that that is the truth, isn't it? If I'm a little below average, that's not enough. If Graham claims to be an 80% free throw shooter and his outcomes are here, that's not enough. It's got to be extreme for me to say no possibility. There is no way that it could be as good as you claim and outcomes be that far bad. So in this case, my mu is that I am less than or equal to some number. My alternative is I'm bigger than some number. So you would have to be way out here in the right tail to get rejection. It's got, again, it has to be extreme. It can't be close. The burden of proof is always on you to prove that they're not telling the truth. If it's a close call, then I'll use free throws because that's an easy one, okay? So Petra went out, she's been practicing, she shot 10,000 free throws and you made 75% of them, great. Does that mean you're going to make three out of four every time you shoot? No, that was your lifetime average. The next time you go out, you might make 10 in a row. You might miss three or four in a row. It's, just, it's called a small sample. But if you went out and you shot way different than 75%, then we'd start questioning the 75%. But because every time you shoot, it's a new thing. It's like the coin flip. Every time you do it, it starts over. It's not keeping track. There are no computer chips saying, OK, now i got to land tails, now i got to land heads. So, all outcomes that are anywhere near the 75% would be reasonable every time you shot. It's if it's way different that we'd start questioning. So the 40,000 mile tires, if it's way different, we start questioning. Because if they last 40,000 and every one of us buys a set, are we all gonna get exactly 40,000? Not a possibility, but will some of us maybe get way more? Maybe, because of the way we drive. Some of us maybe get way less because of the way we drive. But if the overall group average was right at 40,000, then there's no problem. But even this really good safe drivers, you know, and do all that, as a group we did it and we were way less than 40,000 as an average. Now you'd say, no, no, that's, that claim has to, has to change. Okay? The third case is tricky. I'm claiming equal, not equal. Well, not equal in which direction? Yes. Not equal. Both directions. I would like to know, is my scale accurate? You don't say, oh, it weighs heavy, that's OK. <laughs> it weighs light, that's OK. No, it, it's accurate or it's not accurate. When you say it's inaccurate if it's either direction, if it's too heavy or too light, do the 10-pound bag of potatoes weigh 10 pounds? No, they all weigh more than 10 pounds, that's OK. No, it's not. They either weigh 10 pounds or they don't. So I'm going to reject in either tail. So these are the three possibilities. And you always look at the alternative to figure out what's going to cause rejection. It has to be extreme. OK? So now, this is where the magic numbers come in. I'll, I'll remind you what they are again. The z for a half a percent is 2.576. And by the way, at your t tables, I don't know if anybody knows this, at the bottom of your t table are all the magic numbers. Remember when it said large sample? 
I said large sample for T actually turns into Z. In calculus, that's called a limit. But the T table gives you three decimal place values. That's the advantage of the T table over the Z table. The Z table only gives you two decimal places. So that Z of 0.01 is 2.326. Z of 0.025, we know that's 1.96. I'm going to put a zero for consistency because it actually is a zero in that position. And the other one, Z, for exactly 5% in a tail is 1.645. We've really not used this one. We have used the other ones. Now, these are the numbers that you're actually going to use when you're doing hypothesis testing. You use these ones when it's a two-tailed test. Which one of these is a two-tailed test? I haven't defined it, but it should be obvious. Which one's a two-tailed test? Yeah, the last one, because I reject in either tail. Oh, that's where I take my alpha and I split it in half. I put half in each tail. The other two, these are one-tailed tests. This one or this one. The alpha level has to be known before you start the problem. In real life, the vast majority of time, the alpha level we use is simply 0 0.05. What does that mean? We want to exclude the 5% of the most extreme values. In one direction, the other, or split doesn't matter. If it's something like a pharmaceutical, or something where we say, you know, this is really important that we get it right. How about a court of law? It's, it's even more important that we get it right. That's when we would use an alpha of 0 0.01 because we want to make rejection harder, not easier. If you were on trial, do you want to make a guilty verdict harder or easier if you are on trial? Harder. harder. <laughs> That's why you would go with the 01. You would want things to have to be even more extreme before somebody came up with the conclusion of guilt. If I have a product that I'm trying to, you know, the FDA is trying to approve and we want to make sure it's absolutely safe, we want to make it harder to approve, not easier. If we make it harder to approve and we still approve it, then we have more faith in it, don't we? But if we made it easy to approve and it wasn't safe, then we could, you know, get into certain trouble. So, here's the situation. My null hypothesis is that P is less than or equal to 0 0.5. My alternative hypothesis is that P is greater than 0.5. And my alpha level is 0 0.05. We want to state the criteria for rejecting the null hypothesis, which I'm just going to write H0. I'm going to be lazy. H0 is the null hypothesis. That's the first one. There's no calculation here. So here's what I always do. Remember when we first started calculating probabilities of Z inequalities? I said draw the picture. This is where you want to draw the picture. You want to draw the picture. And those magic numbers are on your formula sheet. They're also at the bottom of your t-table. It's easier if you look at the bottom of your t-table than try to find them in your z-table, because the z-table's got thousands of numbers. These are the last row of your t-table. What does this picture look like? I'm saying whatever it is is going to happen less than or equal to half the time. I have a coin that I think is going to land heads at most half the time. That's another way you can think about this. It's going to land heads at most half the time. What will cause me to reject? Which side, the left tail or the right tail? Right tail. It's a greater than, so it's the right tail. 5%, how do I know? Because my alpha was 05. So the question is, what is the Z value that goes right here? What's the Z that goes with 05? We just, we just wrote it down. 1.645. So we write in words. And this, by the way, is part of every problem. You always write in words what your criteria is before you go and you collect your data. You don't collect your data and then determine what will cause rejection. 
You determine what causes rejection before you even start the problem. Reject the null hypothesis if what? 1.645, if I'm more than 1.645, less than 1. what direction am I going to reject? So if, and I'm going to write a, a new term here. This is the measured Z value. What do I mean measured? You went out and you collected a sample. You calculated a Z value. I had Petra shoot 100 free throws. You know, your P hat. I calculated the Z value from the experiment. If the calculated Z value is bigger than the line in the sand here, I will reject the null hypothesis. If my calculated Z value is not bigger, maybe my calculated Z falls here. It falls here. In fact, it falls anywhere to the left of here, then we simply say there's not enough evidence to reject. There's not enough evidence to find you guilty, therefore you're not guilty. Therefore, we will continue using the null hypothesis as the truth. Doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It doesn't matter if you believe the person on trial is guilty or innocent. What does the evidence say? Was there enough evidence to convict them or not convict them? If there aren't degrees, by the way. <laughs> you're guilty or you're not guilty. There are no degrees of not guilty. But they were almost guilty. Right? They were almost guilty. No, no, they were not guilty. They weren't almost guilty. That's like saying we almost won the game. Almost winning the game still means what? Lost. You lost. Are there degrees of lost? <laughs> no, you lost. <laughs> Do you think the Super Bowl loser takes solace in, but we almost won? That's probably worse, isn't it? We didn't win. It's not a degree of how close we came to winning. All right, next one. The null hypothesis is that the mean is exactly 100. And what would the alternative hypothesis be? That the mean is not 100. That it's not 100. And I'm going to give you an alpha of 0 0.01. I mean, a 1% alpha. So, which one of these pictures am I using now? Now. So that means how much is in each tail? Here's an easy way to think about it. Between the tails, I have 99% of all my outcomes. The tails exclude the most extreme 1%. This is real life. I'm excluding the most extreme 1%. Can I ever exclude zero? Well, no, because remember, it'd go forever in each direction. I'm excluding the most extreme 1%, and I'm capturing 99% of all possible outcomes. What is the Z value that goes with this? 2.576. 2.576. So I will reject the null hypothesis if my measured value of z is what? Bigger than 2.576. Great. Um, what about this one? Would I also do that? Or what? Less than. Less than what? If that's 2.576, then what's this? One minus that? No, no, this is the 2.576 is the z value, not the probability. Well, if, if, yes, if that z is 0 and that z is 2.576, then that would have to be negative 2.5. Oh, 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 oh. So what am I putting here? Yes. If I'm bigger than the big Z or more negative than the big negative Z. Everybody cool with that? Now, this one here is the trickiest for most because i got to say two things. Bigger than the big, smaller than the small. Here's the only error that ever occurs on this one. And tell me why this is an error. I'm going to remove the negative sign. Why is that an error? I want you to reject everything to the right of this or to the left of this. Then aren't I rejecting everything? 
Does everybody see that? If I say to the right or to the left of the same number, then I've rejected every possible outcome. No, I only want to reject the extreme outcomes. Oh, smaller than that. So it's always going to be bigger than a positive or smaller than a negative. Whenever you're smaller, it's smaller than the negative. If you say smaller than the positive, then you're eliminating almost all outcomes. Wrong direction. All right, let's try another one. Uh, we're not going to do chi-square today. We're not going to do t today. So I just want to stick with z today, just so conceptually we have the idea. When we start mixing in the other things, it won't be hard. But let's get one thing down first. All right, so my null hypothesis is that, all right, going back to at least an 80% rate of shooting. So my alternative is? Uh, less than. Less than. My alpha level, let's say, is 0.01. That by choosing an alpha that small, that means his results have to be really far away before I reject it. You like that. <laughs> if it's you, you always want a small alpha. You want to make it really hard. So you're on trial. You want to make guilt really hard to come up with as a decision. So to say that you're not telling the truth or that you're not as good as you claim, you would rather make that harder, not easier. That's just how it works in reality. Most of the time, it's 05. All right, so what does my picture now look like? You don't have to draw the picture. You should always draw the picture. Because people that don't draw the picture usually go in the wrong direction because they're trying to do it in their head. I just gave a calculus test yesterday morning, and there were some questions where they had to do some setup. And I said, draw the picture. It's real easy. Almost every single person who did the problem without the picture had the wrong answer. Every single person who drew the picture got the right answer. And the picture was simple, but it told them where the boundaries were, left, right, up, down. And I was like, why would you try to do that in your head? Just draw the simple picture that goes with the explanation. Oh, and now interpret it. The simple picture that goes with this says, I'm going to reject on the left tail or the right tail? Left tail. Left tail. So what is the z value that goes with a tail of 0 0.01? 2.326. 2.326. Is I am going to reject the null hypothesis if my measured z is, wait a minute, if that's 0, then what is that? That's negative 2.326, isn't it? Because I'm that way, so what am I going to do? This makes it easy. <laughs> it has to be this, that and that have to be the same. You're only going to reject in the extreme that way direction, so what number is here? 2.326? Negative, negative. negative 2.326. Ah, was there a single calculation involved in this? No. But if I don't state it correctly, I'm probably going to make the wrong conclusion. If I put positive 2.326, I'm going to reject the lowest 99% of all outcomes. Wait a minute, I'm going to reject almost 100% of all outcomes. That would be bad. If I put bigger than the positive, then I'm only going to reject this way. Oh, no, no, no. The, the alternative hypothesis says, okay, Graham's claiming to be an 80% free throw shooter at least. He doesn't have to make over 80% every time he shoots to prove that. He really has to be way less to disprove that. Way less. Because why? If I take a fair coin and flip it 10 times, can't I still get seven tails occasionally or six tails occasionally? Does that now make it an unfair coin? No, it's a reasonable outcome. Oh, because we put a confidence interval around it. So here's an easier way to think about this. If we put a confidence interval around as 80%, it's going to go bo in both directions, which means the low end is a reasonable outcome and the high end is a reasonable outcome. But if we go way past the confidence interval, then we start saying that's not a reasonable outcome. That's really what we're saying here. That's why when... You know, Graham goes out and shoots 79.5% on his next round of free throws. Oh, he's obviously lying. No, actually, I'd say just the opposite. That's pretty darn strong support that he's telling the truth. He goes out and shoots 55%. <laughs> I'd say, no, that's, that's way too far off. You know, that'd be like Steph Curry missing two free throws in a row. Wait a minute. I've seen him do that two times. I've also seen him make 20 in a row at least 20 times. Because overall, he still makes over 90%, doesn't he? But Steph Curry, 
can still miss a couple free throws in a row. Does that now make him a bad free throw shooter? No. No. Because overall, he's still making over 90% of the free throws. He doesn't necessarily have to make exactly nine out of every 10 he attempts. It's just overall. So on one particular free throw, we'd say the probability he makes is really, really, really high. But it's not one. It's .9 something, but it's not one. So is it still possible he misses on any individual try? Of course. So that's why when we're doing stuff, we only consider rejecting the extremes. How do I know what direction the extreme is? It's always in the direction of the alternative hypothesis. That's it. So what we're doing today, there's no, there's no math. It's how do I state what it is I'm trying to find? And then once I do that, what will cause me to reject it? So the next thing we're going to do is the actual, now we went out, collected data, here's what we saw. We're going to calculate a z-value or a t-value or a chi-square value, whatever it is for that problem. And now it makes it easy. It's black and white. The number I calculated, think of this as the line in the sand. And here's the way I like to say it. All right. Okay, how many here uh, have siblings? Okay. You guys understand king of the couch? Everybody knows what king of the couch is, right? Especially if you're the older sibling, then you were the king of the couch. If you're the younger sibling, you probably, you know, got tossed into the shark infested waters. Everybody understands that concept, I hope. If you, have, if you don't have siblings, I'm sorry. You, you know, the whole fighting over the couch thing, and everybody knows that, that if you hit the ground, that's the shark infested. Well, in my house, it was actually way worse. It's the shark infested lava. Because everybody, it's either shark infested waters or hot lava. One of those two, right? You all grew up with that. So in my house, it's the shark infested lava. Here's how this works exactly. This is the shark infested lava. If we reach the shark infested lava, you are guilty. You're dead. You're burned up. So, we're in the safe zone. Outside of this door is shark infested lava, and it goes forever and ever and ever. And ever. We went, we collected a sample, and your sample outcome was way over here. That made the decision really easy. We're rejecting the null. You are not even close, but you are guilty. We rocket launched you into the shark infested lava. Here's the problem a lot of people have. Your result was right here. You were mostly guilty. Are you guilty if you're right there? No. So they're like saying, you ran full speed, and right here you hit the brake, but you didn't go into the shark infested lava. You're not guilty. You don't say, but you were almost guilty. You almost went into the shark. No, you did or you didn't. So the person who's able to put on the brakes right here is not guilty. We failed to reject the null hypothesis. There wasn't enough evidence. You don't say, but I almost did. No, you, but you didn't. Now, here's the, the other one that people struggle with a little bit. You are just barely in there. You were almost not guilty. You were almost not guilty. You were, you barely fell into the shark infested lava and died. There's no degree of guilt. You're guilty or you're not guilty. You don't say, yeah, but you were really guilty. You were so guilty. No, you're guilty or you're not guilty. You rejected the null or you did not reject the null. There's no degree here. So I always find it interesting when you barely rejected the null, you barely made it into the shark infested lava, you're still in the shark infested lava. Doesn't matter how far out you were launched. <laughs> Is everybody okay with that? There's a line in the sand. You're on this side. You're on that side. That's it. Now, one of the things I always find interesting is when you're watching the news and things have happened. You know, somebody's on trial, let's say. Somebody's on trial. They've been accused of something. And, and by the way, public opinion has usually already, you know, set in. Everybody knows they're guilty or everybody knows. But the trial takes place. The verdict takes place. We now have it. You were found guilty. You're no longer the accused. You are now guilty of the crime, period. That's an absolute black and white, no gray area. You don't still say, but well, there's still a chance. No, you're found guilty. Does anyone who Jerry Sandusky is? He was the Penn State coach a few years back when Joe Paterno was still alive. He was the Penn State coach that for 40 years as a Penn State coach, abused and molested young boys as the coach on the facility in the lockers themselves. And apparently many, many people knew. This was one of the worst situations I've ever heard. This guy was Satan. 
He was so evil. Oh, you know, by the way, he was a great assistant coach. 40 years he got away with horrific acts. When it was finally you know, brought forth because literally hundreds and hundreds of people over many years came forward. You know, does that sound familiar in recent years? The whole, it, it took the first person coming forward always. And then the floodgates opened. He was found guilty and his, I believe he was sentenced to multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. And I, I'm, I'm not positive, but I think he died in prison now quite a while ago. Weeks after he was found guilty, and they were still referring to him as the accused on the news, which I found unbelievably offensive. He was found guilty in a court of law, was now going to spend the rest of his life in prison, and they were still talking about him as the accused, because if you're the accused, you haven't been found guilty. There's still a possibility you're going to be set free. And for weeks, they kept referring to him on the news as the accused. No, once the guilty verdict was set, you are guilty. By the way, even if it was a miscarriage of justice, even if it was a mistake, you are guilty, period. There would have to be a whole retrial and something else happened, which, by the way, just doesn't happen ever. Um, so if I reject the null hypothesis, we're done. It's been rejected. I talked about... Um, um, God, I'm so forgetting the, the sugar substitute. They talk about the pink stuff. Um, yeah, uh, it's called. <laughs> I, I'm totally drawing a blank. It back in the it was in the early 1980s. I remember um, hearing that it had been banned. Aspartame. No, no, that's 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 a newer one. Um, so let me just look it up on your computer. What what is the? We want to know what the compound. Uh, I think it's saccharin. Or something. Saccharin. God, no, thank you, thank you. I was going to go crazy. It's going to keep me awake at night. Saccharin. Everybody heard of saccharin? Mm -hmm. Saccharin is still the number one artificial sweetener, I believe, in the United States. Saccharin is illegal in almost every country in the world, I think, still. I, had, so I knew somebody who literally was arrested at the Canadian border because they had a box of, pig, of sweet milk, <laughs> which is illegal in Canada, because it is so dangerous. It has a warning. If you ever look it up, it has a warning on it about how you know, it causes cancer in laboratory rats. Well, everything causes cancer in laboratory rats. We know that. But the thing was, I remember it was in the early 1980s, and I'm hearing in this report that I believe, I, I don't want to convict, but I think it was UCLA Labs, they had found that it was dangerous and it was going to be banned. It was actually banned for a short period of time. For a short period of time it was banned. And then it was discovered that the testing was a little bit sketchy. Let's just put it that way. There were ulterior motives involved. People wanted it to be banned because they knew it was dangerous. Problem? It fell here and not here. Now, here's the thing. If the sample is larger and larger and larger, you're still going to get the same numbers, but you're going to be more extreme on your z-values. We know that. Remember, the bigger the sample, we, we know things are easier to work with. But it was not done well. It was not done correctly. And so, therefore, it was allowed to come back, and it can never be made illegal again. It's the, literally the double jeopardy. So the compromise was just put a warning label on it. Cigarettes have a warning label. We all know how dangerous they are. But people don't think of artificial sweeteners as being something that is really dangerous. No, it is actually really dangerous stuff. If, you, if you're ingesting it on a regular basis. If you smoked a cigarette, are you going to die of cancer? No. <laughs> no, but if you became a chain smoker for a long period of time, yes, you're probably likely. Yeah, a cigarette is not going to harm you. A, a packet of of the pink stuff is not going to harm you. It's continued use over a long period of time. That's where the, the danger is. So the fact is that, that something like that could be messed up. We would never want something like that to ever happen again. So when something is tested, we've got to get the results right. Now, what if I test something and I am fudging my results? And I say, aha, you're not telling the truth, and I come out publicly. I mean, you can say, let's see the evidence, and now we expose the evidence. Well, now you're liable, and there's lawsuits involved. and. <laughs> So you, you're watching a commercial and you're saying, I don't believe that's true. You know, they have, I don't know what television stations they have, it, but every now and then, you know, I'd have the news on and they'd have, let's call it a watchdog. They'll have some report on the news where there was some, I don't know if that's the best term, but somebody who was looking out for your best interest found something sketchy somewhere and they reported it and, you know, and it's, it's actually a good thing. Okay. Does anyone know who Ralph Nader is? You ever heard that name? 
He was around, I think, going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. He was called a consumer advocate, but he was the most extreme of all. He would attack and go after big companies who, who he thought were cheating or lying or doing things that were dangerous, and he would expose them. Oh, he was not a popular person for a large sector of the country, but he was, he was a hero to a lot of people. He exposed a lot of bad things over the years. That was his job. Purely statistically, he'd say, here's what's actually happening. Here's the numbers. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, there, there's a book he wrote called Unsafe at Any Speed. It was about, I, God, what was it? It was, um, it was the car that exploded on impact. Um, uh, yeah, you, you can look it up. Uh, there, uh, it's, it, I believe it was a Ford. The Corvair, the Chevy Corvair. Oh, was it the Corvair? Oh, that was even before that. There, there was also a car that, that, because of where the gas tank was in the car, it would explode often in a car accident. It got hit. Um, that car no longer exists. That, he exposed that, and they took it off the market. That was the kind of stuff he did. And, and the fact that there's somebody like that out there is good for us, isn't it? Because there's always somebody who protects them. I, I actually met him at San Diego State once. He was giving a, a talk many years ago, you know, later in his life. Um, Difficult thing to take on, you know, you're, you're, you're the protector of society, which means you're going after big companies, oh, cigarettes, everything else. Um, but, but the idea being that if something's happening and it's legal and it's, you know, and you're going, wait a minute, I don't think that's right. Your evidence has to be overwhelming before you can say no. You can't be doing that. You can't be saying that. Because if it's not overwhelming, now you're the one looking bad. In fact, you're the one who, you know, is liable and slander and all these horrible things. And remember, they're the big company, so they have all the lawyers and the money. <laughs> so, so you have to be right. And I say it's kind of like the old West. You know, Dylan and I are playing poker, and Dylan accuses me of cheating. Well, I'm, I'm going to pull out my six minutes and shoot you. But what if I am cheating? Well, if you can prove that I'm cheating... Now, I'm the one that's going to look really bad. But you accusing me is not good enough, is it? You have to have overwhelming evidence. Oh, simply saying, I think they're cheating, that's, that's not good enough. But if you had overwhelming evidence, now I'm the one that's looking really, 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 really bad. So I used to tell my kids, you know, we'd be playing, I would never accuse somebody of cheating, ever. What if they are? You have to have overwhelming evidence. Because if you accuse somebody of cheating, you're... Whatever happens afterwards, that's on you. you know? <laughs> They're probably not going to react very nicely to you. And yeah, you, you got to be careful. Well, that's what we're talking about. How do you mathematically prove somebody's cheating? By doing what we're about to do. And, and I don't want to use the word cheating, but you know, something is not what it's claimed to be. Let's, let's say it that way. Okay? Let's go ahead and. Let's go. All right, let's take a short.